Amen. Do you know this year is Reverend Finley's 25th anniversary of serving full time on our youth staff here? And tonight he's going to preach. Well, I'm of all men. I'll try that again. Testing, testing. We're there. Good. All right. Well, I'm of all men blessed because I get to work at Grace and serve an awesome, mighty, powerful God. And so it is wonderful to be with you here again. And, uh, you know, I didn't work this message out the, uh, tonight in the way that it happened. Uh, I was actually in the middle of it, and I was like, hmm, I'm preaching about another lame man tonight. And uh, it, it's just funny how God works things out. And first of all, let me just thank Dr. Harmon for the privilege of being able to uh, preach the Word of God and uh, share God's Word with you. The title of my message tonight is Remembering the Compassion of God. Remembering the Compassion of God. Now, that would seem kind of a funny title to start off your, uh, your, your sermon with. Uh, I mean, don't we always remember uh, God? Don't we always remember His compassion? And yes, but also no. And I can tell you this because right now I'm taking uh, some classes at a seminary in Tennessee. And uh, I have had such wonderful professors from Dr. Miller to Dr. Shackelford to Dr. Kilpatrick. They're all doctors. Um, and I'm um, just having a wonderful time, although I'm sure they're wearing out a lot of their red ink pens on my papers. But uh, it has just been a privilege. To, but I'm getting a lot of head knowledge. And I'm always concerned that with the head knowledge, I continually develop the heart knowledge. And uh, that's a danger in your Christianity that you just perfunctionally go through the motions instead of uh, really loving and enjoying what you're doing. And it's so with that kind of an emphasis tonight, I want to point out this wonderful historical story to you tonight and uh, encourage you that, yes, we have a tremendous amount of head knowledge and we always want to develop that. Knowledge is important, but we also want to have that heart knowledge, and connect the two uh, to the glory of God. Well, tonight in 2 Samuel chapter 9 is going to be our passage of Scripture, 2 Samuel chapter 9, and it's simply remembering the compassion of God. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the time to be able to preach the word of God. Father, I pray that uh, by your spirit that you would make the word of God very clear Give me a liberty to make it very clear. Strike that which you do not want them to know out of their memory. And uh, Father, touch these lips of clay uh, as I am so humbled to be able to preach the word of God that it may bring honor and glory to you. Father, if there's one here that does not know you as Savior, may today be the day of salvation. Oh God, may they taste and see how good you are. And you are so good. Father, you have been faithful even when we've been faithless. Father, we ask your blessing upon the preaching and teaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 9 is where we're going to be here tonight. And before we uh, get into uh, the points of the message, let me give you some preliminary thoughts to start us out tonight. And the first being that King David, uh, really when we come to 2 Samuel chapter 9, this is a book, actually 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel used to at one time be one book, but they were divided, and 2 Samuel is all about the life of David. The book reveals David's victories and unfortunately some of his defeats. In chapters 1 through 10, we read of his national victories. And my friend, if we could have stopped at chapter 10, that would have been great. But then we see chapter 11 through 24, we read of some of his personal defeats. And they were difficult and they were trying. I mean, we've seen God do great things in David's life from that lowly shepherd boy that was out in the field tending his father's Jesse's sheep to one day standing before a giant and taking that giant down by the power of God, by faith in God, knowing that God could defeat that giant. And you know what? We have giants in our lives, things and circumstances that come into our lives and we feel so inadequate. And we are for the task that God has given us or what lays before us. But let me remind you that God is faithful 
And God can overtake those giants and make those giants, even in your life, they can, he can dwarf them in comparison to who he is. God is faithful. And so we see this book is both cheers and tears. Sin's warning echoes through the pages, reminding us that we can choose our sin, but we can't choose our consequences. Sin's warning echoes, and and David suffers the consequences of sin, both personally in his family's life and nationally with his people. David confessed his sin and submitted to the discipline and spent the remainder of his reign preparing for the building of the temple. We know that David was a man of war. David was a bloody man. And so, therefore, his heart's desire was to build God's temple. But God said, no, you've been a man of war. Someone else will build my temple. And so what David did is he began to prepare for the building of the temple. He began to get everything together that who would ever be the next king, Solomon, would be able to build that temple to the glory of God. It was beautiful, my friend. And so he was preparing for that at the end of his life. But it's this two verses that really kind of ring out as we go forward in this book. And they are Proverbs 14, 34, which says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You know, sin is like a a rock in the middle of a calm lake. It kerplunks and then it begins to ripple. And the effects that it begins to have in other people's lives is evident. And that's why we need to remember that we as individuals can live victorious lives because of Jesus Christ and are not victims, but victors. And we can overcome sin. And then when we overcome that sin through the blood of Jesus Christ and on a regular basis coming to him and asking for forgiveness, for we remember in 1 John 1, 9, it says if we can confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you, like me, are looking at the news, you're looking out on the horizon, and you're seeing that America is not a country that is still honoring God but is a country that has become more concerned with satisfying the lusts of the heart more than pleasing God Almighty. It kind of reminds me what it was said in Judges. They did that which was right in their own eyes. And my friend, again, you can choose your sin, but you can't choose your consequences. And judgment begins at the house of the Lord. And we need to remember that we are the salt and light in this world. And the greatest sermon you're going to preach is when you leave this place and go home with your families and minister to them and then also to the workplace and minister to them and begin to have a conversation by the lifestyle that you live, a verbal conversation, but also a conversation that's lived before others. Another impactful verse that we are reminded through the entirety of the book of Second Samuel is Proverbs twenty-eight thirteen, And it says that he that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. You know what? That's one of the things that we need in our lives is to keep short accounts with God. Do you know what I remember one time having some relatives over to my house? This was when I was SM all, so small. And I remember in our house, there was a stink that began to occur to the point that my dad actually began to search out this stink. I mean, it was rough. And he was looking for this stink. And as he began to search it, break holes into the wall. I mean, that's how bad it was. One night, he simply came over to one of my relatives and began to realize it was that relative. They had not showered or bathed in quite some time, and the smell was affecting the rest of the household. Well, my friend, we need to remember in our spiritual lives that we need to confess, 
forsake, not keep it hidden, expose it, confess it, and forsake it, and get it out of our lives. David is a man that we see at the end of life is very different. At the end of this book is very different. It's funny, 2 Samuel starts out with a poem, and it ends with a plague. But these are happier times we are focusing on tonight in chapter 9. And as we turn our attention for the whole book of King David's life and its victories and defeats, we focus on one chapter that reveals such compassion and kindness. And it is so needed today. It's the aloe to that sunburn. David finally has peace in chapter 8. Excuse me, David finally has peace. If we read in chapter 8, it's like a who's who of defeated foes. He has been having to conquer and deal with the enemies of the land, finally bringing peace to that land. And then finally, his his foes are defeated, and David turns from the bitterest foe, Saul, to the best friend, Jonathan. David's mind begins to return to younger years and close friendship that he had with Jonathan. You know, I I think it's no mistake right here that uh, David begins to reflect. I think sometimes in the days of peace after difficulty, you you begin to reflect on those that have had a significant impact in your life. And so we see in First, uh, Second Samuel chapter 9, that he is reflecting on his great friendship with Jonathan. And don't you remember that song, Let's Be Knitted Together, like Ruth and Naomi, like Jonathan and David? Well, let me just bring three points to your attention in First and Second Samuel chapter 9. And they are, number one, the king's request motivated by a covenant Secondly, the king's request, research manifested by, by a calling. And then finally, the king's restoration measured by a change. We see the first point in chapter 9, verses 1 to 4, the king's request motivated by a covenant. In chapter 9, verses 1 to 4, And David said, Is there any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was... Of the house of Saul, a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, he, the king, said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not any of the house of Saul that I may show kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath a son which is lame. On his feet. Now it's interesting that the name Mephibosheth is not brought up here. Just a son who is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto him, The king, behold, he is at the house of Mekra, the son of Amel in Lodibar. As we look at this, we see a promise right from the beginning. A promise of what? A promise of kindness made earlier in David's life. David made a request about a long-lost friend, Jonathan, who unfortunately had been killed on the battlefield of Jerel. And the covenant, a promise made between the two, was as strong as their friendship. Notice the request is made not out of loyalty to the past king Saul, but really out of loyalty to his friend, Jonathan. And as we turn back, we see this promise, this covenant between the two, David and Jonathan. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse, excuse me, 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 3, it says, Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. That was the basis of this covenant. This promise between the two was love. We also notice that in verses 1, 3, and 7, we see the same phrase over and over, kindness. In one and three, it's just kindness. But in verse three, it's the kindness of God. David, after all these years of conquering, now turns his life to the compassion of an old friend. You know, when we think about 
the relationship David had with Saul and Jonathan. It's very different. We know that John, or excuse me, Saul was an enemy of David, and he was the king. But then we also see Jonathan and these two being brought closer together. And this love that we're talking about was not an immoral love. It was a love much like is described a phileo love, an intense love, brotherly love. Almost like back in the day when we would say that we were blood brothers, that we would come together, that we would have a bond between individuals. And when we think about this idea, we see this covenant continue in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 14. And thou shalt not only, while yet I live, show me kindness of the Lord, that I die not. So this covenant is not only when David and Jonathan are living, but when they also die. And in 1 Samuel 20, verse 17, And Jonathan caused David to swear again, because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. And then finally, in 1 Samuel 20, verse 42, And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace for as much as ye have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Wow, what an incredible... So this is not only between them together when they're alive, but when they're departed, and maybe one is not alive, and then the covenant goes and extends even to future generation, to the seed. That's how intense this covenant was. Oh, but my friend, you know, as David was doing all the conquest and facing some of the foes that he had, Saul being one of the greatest of them, I'm sure that David could have gotten wrapped up in Saul chasing him. And unfortunately, what could have happened is David could have forgotten about uh, Jonathan because he focused on Saul. And there could have developed within his life some bitterness. You know what? It's always good to take bitterness. Take care of it as a root. Take care of it when it's small. Don't allow bitterness to grow within your life because it affects not only the individual that the individuals that are around you, but it affects the individual that has that bitterness. And I'm sure David could have focused on Saul and dismissed Jonathan as being a part of the family, but that wasn't David's way. David didn't get bitter. You know, when you love somebody, unfortunately, and you put yourself out there, there is the opportunity for that love to be ignored, for that love to be pushed away. There's a sacrifice sometimes in loving someone. And Jonathan, we see, and David here, we see, does not get wrapped up in that, but he loves Jonathan, even despite the way his father had treated them. First Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 9 says this. It says, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that you should inherit a blessing. David could have gotten bitter, but he didn't. He chose to honor that covenant and show kindness in that covenant, not only to Jonathan in his memory, but to, Jonathan, to, to Jonathan's family. You know, I remember one time I was in high school and uh, there was a young lady that I knew was in one of my classes. And, and I remember just through our class being together and I remember meeting her mom one time. And the mom had been horribly treated by her husband. Infidelity had occurred and adultery and they were divorced. But the thing I remember the most about this lady that I met was that the bitterness started in her heart, but the bitterness slowly crept out in the way she looked and the way she talked. And my friend, let me tell you something. The only way to get that bitterness out of your life is to forgive, is to forgive the individual that has done that to you. It's the only way to forgive and then to go forward. And by the way, I'm not sitting up here saying, well, that's so easy. Go ahead and do that anytime you want. 
We're talking about spiritually mature things. But my friend, listen, it's the only way to go forward. And if David would have chosen to focus on Saul instead of his friendship with Jonathan, we wouldn't have seen this incredible story unfold before us like it is right now. Be careful. Take care of those things. And so, so that they don't grow into an oak tree in your life. So a promise, but then we also see a petition. Who? Who is the individual? It's the lame son of Jonathan. This question is repeated twice, once in verse 1 and then again in verse 3. It was a general question in verse 1, but now it's getting a little bit more specific. Now he's talking to Ziba, a servant of Saul, but now that is serving David. And Ziba is on the inside. He knows what's going on. The story of this boy's lameness that Ziba tells to David is recounted in 2 Samuel 4.4, 4, repeated a little earlier, and here's what it says. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jerel. And his nurse took him and fled and came to pass that as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame, and his name is Mephibosheth. So you understand whenever a king is defeated in battle, the new regime would come in and the old relatives of that king that had been disposed of flee for their life because the new king would come in and then would slowly take out the relatives that would pose a problem of becoming a king and try to take their kingship back. And so we see that this nurse takes Mephibosheth, this young child, probably about five years old, and runs, and he becomes lame in the exit of this. We not only see the petition, who, a lame son of Jonathan, but we also see a place where Lodabar. This is a non-Israelite state in the Transjordan, north of the Yarmuk River. This place is mentioned several times in Scripture and has a variety of different names. Here, a little later, in 2 Samuel 17, 27, it talks about Lodabar. David is actually go to, goes to Lodabar when he's fleeing out of his country. And also in Amos 6, 3, Lodabar is mentioned as in words of judgment. It is going to be judged. But what I think is so interesting about Lodabar is the, the two Hebrew elements, lo, which means no, and debar, which means thing. No thing. I mean, this is not like, where are we going on vacation, mom and dad? Well, we're going to Lodabar. That's not a place you're going to go and you're going to visit. Okay, the very word, the very name of it is no, nothing. All right? And so this is where we find Mephibosheth. And so... This name gives us a hint of the type of location that Jonathan's son was living in. With all the information, now David has the opportunity to act. And we were reminded of the opportunity, each of us as Christians, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, that we have towards other people. To look and to consider their situation and, if we can, help them. But we're reminded to not only help them monetarily, physically, but we need to help them by giving them the great message of who Jesus Christ is. That will not only change their outward circumstances, but change the inside. Oh, my friends, haven't you heard of people that are in prison and get saved? And even though they're in that prison for the first time in their life, they're free. They're free. They have a freedom that no bar can hold because they know Jesus Christ as their Savior. You know, I, I, it, our seminary in Mid-America makes us, I'm, excuse me, doesn't make us watch chapel. They give us the opportunity to watch chapel. And they have a, a, a time where they get together and just tell different testimonies. And those different testimonies are so glorious. And uh, uh, there was an army gentleman that is reaching out to those that have been in war and that have suffered from PTSD and he was talking with one guy, and the, the individual got saved. And as he got saved, this guy testified that his whole demeanor changed. See, that's what the gospel does. It's the good news of changing us from the inside out. And we see this situation of a gentleman, this, this young man, who's lame and who's living in Lodabar. 
we have the opportunity by the Spirit of God to encourage other people. If he, or at Galatians 5, 22 and 23, as we sing with the children in junior church, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, we have that fruit in our lives and we're able to give it to other people. We're reminded of Mephibosheth's condition as one that mirrors hours before salvation. Oh boy, we are spiritually lame, not able to come to God in any way. We are dead in our trespasses and sin. It is a great mystery, my friend, that I stand before you here today saved. I had nothing to do with my salvation. Oh wait, yes, I did, I sinned. Yeah. That's the only thing in my salvation is I am a sinner. To say that I had anything to do with my salvation cheapens it through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way. And then one glorious day, by the grace of God, because of the mercy of God, to the glory of God, I was saved. I was dead in my trespasses and sin. I was, I was flatlined. I didn't go looking for God. I was that dog that returned to his vomit. I was that sow that wallowed in the mud. And then Jesus quickened me. That word quickened, I love it. It means to be made alive. I remember that day. It's alive. I truly breathed for the first time living air because of Jesus Christ. And it's... It's glorious. You and I have this wonderful gospel message that we have to bring to other people, to see them changed, gloriously changed. Well, you know what? I got saved when I was in sixth grade and I went to my classes and I just couldn't shut up about Jesus. I, I couldn't. I started going, hey, man, you want to get saved? Come on, man. Let's go. Hey, let's go to church. You want to get saved? You think I'm bad now. You should have seen me back then. I was like, come down. And they were like, listen, Father Finley, we don't want to talk about that. Okay, Father Finley. That's not, I'm, what's a, what do you talk about, Father Finley? Uh, you'll learn about it. Ohio, it was a lot of Catholics around me. And so, I, I, Father Finley, and I didn't really like that. And then they called me Luther Larry. And I was like, all right, now we're getting a little better there. And then I'm like, who's Luther? Are you talking about Martin Luther King? I, 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 you know, I was young, I didn't know. But let, let me just say that, that we should be that salt and light. Now that our lives have changed, we should go. And David is a king here, and he's in a position to go and change lives. And he does that. And we have the opportunity to also. We are a king's kid. The Bible says that we're joint heirs with Jesus. And so the king's request motivated by a covenant. But then also in verses 5 to 8, we see the king's Research manifested by a calling. And so therefore, they begin to have a great search. David sends out a search party to find Mephibosheth and bring him back to King David. And when there is a new king, one of the tasks of the king is to hide so that the new king cannot find and kill any heir of the previous kingship. So that's what he was doing. He was in hiding. But notice that David went to go get Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth didn't come to him. He went to get Mephibosheth and bring him back to him. And he brings Mephibosheth back to him. And then we see this dialogue between David and Mephibosheth. And it's so glorious. We see Mephibosheth fall on his face and did reverence him. There's a physical humility that occurs. And then we also see Mephibosheth that said, behold thy servant. And then later on, I believe it is in verse 8, we see Mephibosheth refer to himself, behold thy servant, and then later on he refers to, I am a dead dog as I am. In fact, it says, and he bowed himself and said, what is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? You are the king, I am nobody. Oh man, talk about humility. You know, someone said, if you come... To God, as a pauper, you'll leave as a prince. But if you come to God as a prince, you'll leave as a pauper. That we would be teachable. That we would allow God's word to speak to our hearts on a regular 
basis. We know what it says in 1 Peter 5, uh, chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. It says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourself unto the older. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and that he may exalt you in due time. We see the king's request motivated by a covenant. We see the king's research manifested by a calling a search, and then finding a servant. But then we see finally the king's restoration measured by a change. And in verses 9 through 13, we see everything changing. And the first thing to change is a restoration of possessions. All that was your father's is now yours. That's what David says to Mephibosheth. All that was your father's, Saul, Jonathan, is now yours. There is a complete restoration. And this is so uncommon because to the victors goes the spoils, but not King David. He was doing this out of a promise to an old friend, for he loved Jonathan. You know, I, I, I can't tell you how many times that I'll be sitting doing something and someone will come to my mind. Someone providentially will come to my mind. Do you ever have that happen to you? To where you're sitting there and all of a sudden God brings someone to your head and you're thinking, whoa, well, I, I, haven't, I haven't thought about that person in a while. And maybe you get out your phone and you start texting them, hey, how's it going? And maybe you start praying. Hey, are you, maybe give them a call. Say, hey, how are you doing? You know, I think God is in the business of moving in that way and maybe just prompting you to think about someone else. As maybe prompting David here to think about Jonathan. Do you remember in the book of Esther when the king was sitting there and there had been a plan to kill him and Mordecai had foiled that plan. But at the right time, God allowed the minutes to be read and for Mordecai's name to be remembered as the one that rescued him so that he could be brought before the king. And Haman sitting there going, <clears throat> yes, this is for me. And then, it got, excuse me, Haman, not you, Mordecai. God doing his thing providentially in his time. And it was time to honor Jonathan. It was time to honor Mephibosheth. I can't tell you what it does for me to serve here at Grace and to have students return. To have students not only return, but also to minister to their children. Up at the wilds, I recently ran into one of my old students, Renee, Arnold, it was. It's now changed to another name. She's married with three beautiful children. And it was like a gift from God. God brings these people in and out of your life to encourage you. I see how God is using individuals like Tim Block and his cute little family for the glory of God. And I get to work and minister with Rachel, Josh, Julie, Elizabeth, Katie, Alicia, all these individuals time and time again. And I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful for the opportunity. You know what? He's given us an opportunity to work with one another, to be encouraged and to be strengthened. The lavish care for Mephibosheth and his family is the difference between living in Lodabar and now living in the palace. It is good for us to all take stock in our possessions because of Christ. We have Christ and that is enough. It was enough for Abel when he, by faith, Worship God through sacrifice. It was enough for Enoch when he by faith walked with God until God took him home. It's enough for Noah when by faith he worked for God by building an ark. And it's enough for Peter, James, John, and Paul because Christ is enough. The possessions that we have that God brings into our life, whether people, whether opportunities to minister, we come to realize because of Christ, we are very, very full. Full of not of the things of this world, but full of the things that only God can give. And then also we see not only a restoration of possessions, but then also a restoration of position. David the king was allowing Mephibosheth not only to come to the palace, but this is how great it gets towards the end. We see that Mephibosheth has a son. That son would also live at the palace, but it gets even more than that. Look at verse 13. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table 
and was lame on both feet. I, I think it's interesting how the story ends with he was lame on both feet. You know what? It's incredible all the promises that we have in God's word. All that we have because of who Christ is. The promises for you and for me. But also the position we have because of Christ We were like that young man living in Lodabar, and we were lame. But because of Christ, as it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, for you have received this, excuse me, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, wherein you cry, Abba, Father. See, before salvation, we called Satan, the father of all lies. He was our daddy. He was our father. But because of Christ, now we're able to call God. Abba, Father. I often wonder how Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth, yeah, after a while, Mephibosheth, after a while, just being in David's presence and now having another dad. Jonathan was taken away at five years old and now having David as almost a dad. And you and I have God as our heavenly father as our dad in our lives. And so we see the promises of God. We see the positions that we have in Christ, but then also we see the preservation and the power we have now to go forward and to live for his glory. You know, Mephibosheth, it's interesting. I I said at the beginning of the sermon that I, I didn't plan to preach last week about a lame man who was healed outside the gates of beautiful And then we read about Mephibosheth, and he was never healed. He is lame. Even later on, we see he's lame later on in the book when there's an insurrection, and he's thought to be a part of that, and he's not. But we we see this. His lameness never left. It was always a part of him. But oh, the change. Oh, the change of going from living in Lodabar to living in in the king's palace. My friend, that we would understand our spiritual position of when we were sinners and now we're saints, not because of anything that we have done, but all because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And so when we come to the end of this, we understand that the king's request was motivated by a covenant, the king's research manifested by a calling, and the king's restoration measured by a change. To God be the glory for great things he has done in Mephibosheth's life, in David's life, and in our lives. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for, again, this time to be in your word. We thank you for this incredible, loving example of David honoring a covenant made with his best friend, Jonathan. But that, Father, that we understand that you have made a covenant with us through your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you that we have a promise not only to live to the honor and glory by the grace of God now, but also we have the glory of heaven one day to come. And so, Father, we thank you so much for the rich salvation that we enjoy. But maybe there's someone in our presence here tonight that they are living in Lodabar. Father, they are like the Bible describes They are outside of Christ. They do not know Christ as their Savior. Oh, but my friend, taste and see that the Lord is good. God is so good, and he wants to save you. He wants you to receive Christ as your Savior. Father, would you, Father, as we have individuals in here maybe that do not know you, maybe there's someone out here tonight that would say, Dear God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Christ's sake. And God, you will, on the authority of your word, save them. And Father, for those that are here amongst us, maybe there is a root of bitterness, even in a believer's life that has begun to grow. And Father, they are having a hard time moving forward and they need to confess and forsake that bitterness or maybe some besetting sin in their life. Well, Father, because of all that we have in Christ, we can overcome that sin by the blood of Christ. And Father, we just pray for anybody in here that is crippled by their sin, that they would confess it and forsake it. 
to bring honor and glory to you. Father, we love you and we thank you. Pray that you would use this in hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.